Hey guys, welcome to episode three of BASED. I am diving right in today because I am amped about my subject matter. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. The title of episode three is Gun Control and Its Racist History. I know, that's a bit of a lightning rod, and I mean for it to be because I want to get your attention. But I also intend to show you exactly why that is 100% factual. Um, And this debate, gun control in the Second Amendment, is one that in my experience can become quite heated very quickly. It's often very emotional. And to some extent, I don't know that that's a bad thing because I think at the root of each side, they want to find ways to conserve life, to conserve liberty, and to protect people. And I think that it makes sense to get emotional about those topics. It makes sense to be passionate about those things. Those are things we should all strive for. Um, But while I think everybody here probably has pretty good intentions, not everybody, there's a few people in the subject matter who do not, and I'll get into that. But most people I think mean well here. Um, But as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And when you really look back at the policies of gun control and the effects of those policies, I think it paints a really clear picture that one side's ideas on the subject matter are severely flawed. And I also think when you look back at the history of this policy, um, it shows that there is a deep-seated systemic racism when it comes to gun control. And what I mean by systemic racism is that we have a system where a lot of our laws uh, were initially put into place with the exact intention of disadvantaging certain populations and continue to have those disproportionalities in the way they're implemented today. Um, So my hope is that at the end of all of this, we can have a little bit better common language. We can knock down some really bad policies that I think are propping up systemic racism. We can talk about better solutions and hopefully come to a better way of understanding how we can best protect life in our society. So let's dive in. Um, I will say, as you can probably tell by my like excitement on this subject, I am not an unbiased referee. I just think I need to be fair and, and give full disclosure on that. Um, I don't like when people in media or in politics are like, I'm unbiased. You're not. You, everybody brings their perspectives and their worldview and their lived experience to all of our subject matters that we talk about, and especially when we get to something like this. Um, it's impossible for me to totally remove myself from it. You know, I grew up in the South. We always had guns. I knew where they were. I knew how they worked. I had a very healthy respect and fear of guns. Um, I never would have messed with my parents' guns. And as we aged and my brother, my younger brother actually became more interested in guns than me, but he started getting like BB guns and then I would kind of go shoot with him under supervision. So it was something that just culturally I grew up around and was more comfortable um, with than a lot of people, I think. Uh, But it wasn't like a passion or hobby of mine. I wasn't like, one of those girls that got super into gun culture. It was just sort of there. More important to me um, was always, I loved history and I loved the constitution. And I really understood um, from an observation of our history and of other societies, how important the right to self-defense is. It is a natural right, which means you're born with it. The government can only take it away. It can't give it to you. And so it's essentially, um, it's essential in our society. And that's why it's enshrined in our bill of rights. And it's not just essential for personal self-defense, but also it's important for self-defense against a always overreaching um, and corrupt government. So I I really believed in that basis. As I aged a little bit, especially once I got out of the home, I was living in Nashville by myself. I didn't have my dad or my brothers around. As a woman, that was when the Second Amendment really started to click to me um, even more so. And I cannot take myself out of that. As a woman, a firearm, the Second Amendment, is the only thing that makes me equal to a man. And it kind of drives me crazy that the feminist movement doesn't lead in that aspect more because I have had friends who have been raped. I have a friend who's been murdered. I have um, many friends who have been victims of abuse. And had they had a firearm, had they been trained, they might be here. They might not have been brutalized in those ways. And and so for me, that is something that I do get emotional when I talk about it. Um, it's very hard to, to remove that. So just up front, that's how I feel about it. Um, but and then lastly, it was actually the uh, Second Amendment was the first policy I ever got paid to work on in politics. Back when I was still in the music industry, I started working um, on the side for a state-based Second Amendment group and really fell in love with the policy. So um, I've got a lot of attachment to it. So anyways, I'm not going to be unbiased, but I will promise you that I'm a meticulous researcher. I try to be as fair-minded as possible. And I I've always done that. I always try to go look at the data and really try to test my beliefs and see if I'm wrong. And I've been known to change my mind on very big emotional-based policies in the past. I'm sure I will again in the future. But with this subject, the more I research, the more I dig in, the more I absorb, the more entrenched I've gotten in this policy because everything, all of the data uh, backs up this position. So I'm I'm gonna make that case for you today, but um, that's where I'm coming from. Um, And I will say too, you know, growing up, 
I, I didn't know a lot of liberals, people on the left, and I think that's so true for people in our society. We don't know people who are different than us. Everybody's in these like very tight bubbles where like, you probably don't closely know people with different political ideologies or religions or socioeconomic backgrounds or races. And so it leads to our ability to like stereotype people and to also create really terrible straw man arguments about what they believe and why. And I had done that. <laughs> A hundred percent. Like, I think even in college when Barack Obama was um, running for president, like, and he was pretty anti-Second Amendment, but I thought for sure he was a socialist. I thought anybody who wanted any kind of variety of, of gun control was a hundred percent a socialist that wanted to use this kind of incremental gun control to eventually usurp our constitution and take away our rights. And to be fair, those people do exist and they do exist in our government. So I'm not totally a conspiracy theory in that way, um, theorist in that way. But as a whole, that's not where most left wing people are coming from. I now get to work around a ton of left wing people. I have good friends that are left wing people. I've gotten out of my bubble. Um, and what I find is that a lot of them own guns. They believe in the Second Amendment. Um, typically, they actually um, are pro gun in some capacity, but they just have different ideas about how to regulate it than I do. Um, and so that's kind of encouraging, I think. I don't, I don't think the chasm is quite as wide as the media makes it seem between uh, people who believe in the Second Amendment and people who want gun control. I think there's actually a lot more overlap. Um, and to get into a little bit of that data, uh, NPR has found that 86% of Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents are in favor of gun control um, compared to 31% of Republicans. But when you dig a bit deeper into that data, what you find is most of them are not uh, in favor of, of unilaterally getting rid of guns. Um, the proposals they tend to favor are things like universal background checks, better mental health screening and treatment programs. I think we can all agree on that. Um, requiring a license to own a gun. They like national red flag law proposals. Um, those are the most popular. And then a couple other ideas that get floated pretty often include banning semi-automatic weapons um, and banning assault rifles or requiring a license to buy a gun. So that's kind of more the honest picture, I think, where most people are coming from in our country. Um, but before we can really have a genuine intellectually honest conversation here and talk about some of those ideas, I think we have to straighten a few things out. This is a constant um, just issue I have when we talk about gun control is we don't have a common vernacular around it. Um, we don't actually have a common basic understanding of firearms and their mechanics in our society anymore. And so if you're a novice, you're going to be very easily misled in this discussion quite quickly. And I see that happen all the time. So we've got to break some of these terms down. And I'm going to explain a couple essential things you need to know about firearms and guns. And this is as somebody who, again, I'm not a gun fanatic. Gun fanatics, please don't come pick me apart here. Like, I promise... <laughs> I've done my due diligence, I've researched it, but uh, I'm, I'm not like a gun enthusiast, so I'm not going to get super granular here. I'm just giving a surface level. It. You can leave it in the comments. Um, I'm sure that you have lots of cool information. There's fact, like fascinating stuff out there about guns, but like I'm like a layman in, in the gun usage thing. I do carry, I have my permit. I keep a little revolver in my purse. It's great, it's beautiful, wooden handle, called a Lady Smith, Smith & Wesson. Great gun um, to carry, great gun for women. but. That's kind of where I leave off, so I'm not going to be able to sit here and talk shop with you, but I can get into the basics, so here we go. Um, first and foremost, there is no such thing as an assault rifle. It is not a thing. Walk into any gun store and ask them for an assault rifle. And if you do, will you please film it and like drop the video in the comments because I'd love to watch. I think it'd be a really funny prank to play and just see their reactions. Um, it's, it's just totally made up. And I didn't know this. I knew it was made up, but I hadn't actually traced its origins back. And I did a little digging for this show. And I found out that assault rifles is actually a made up term that traces its origins back to Adolf Hitler. Like, uh, uh, that man just, I mean, every bad thing, it seems, can find its way back to him. Um, he used the term for propaganda purposes to make his soldiers and their weapons sound tougher in the media. So that's where it came from. Um, in America, the term is, is usually used by left-wing politicians, and typically when they employ it, they're talking about a gun that would fall into the category of like an AR-15. That has caused even more confusion because the average person in America thinks that AR in AR-15 stands for assault rifle or um, automatic rifle. Not the case, no. Um, actually, AR stands for Armalite rifle, which is the original manufacturer who created the patent for the gun. Uh, Armalite Rifle designed their AR-15 in the 1950s, actually, but due to some money problems, they sold the design to Colt, which is another gun manufacturer, in 1959. In 1963, Colt was tapped by the U.S. government to make 
automatic rifles, um, and they became standard issue for troops in Vietnam. That gun was actually the M16. Automatic M16 used in war. Now, that success gave them a lot of great marketing capacity, and what they decided to do was ramp up production on this semi-automatic weapon patent that they had purchased uh, from Armalite that was going to be like the civilian version of the M16, and they called it the AR-15. So essentially what they were trying to do was make a gun that looked cool, that made people feel like they were in the military, and they marketed that, right? The AR-15 has never been used in war. It would not be appropriate. You would get killed if you try to use the AR-15 in war. It is quite literally just a rifle with an outer shelling that looks really cool and it has better stability and like it's a good gun i've shot one i'm a far better marksman with it because it doesn't kick as much um and it's got some good targeting um additions that are usually included with it so i see why people like it it's a great it's a great weapon but to act like it is like this military grade somehow more dangerous weapon no it is a rifle um, and then the 1970s, Colt's patent ran out and lots of other gun manufacturers began making their own because it was so popular. And so that's kind of the history of the AR-15. <laughs> Just a rifle, guys. Um, on to the next needed distinction. If you're confused about the difference in a semi-automatic weapon and an automatic weapon, here is what you need to know. I come across so many people who are under full delusions that we still allow automatic machine guns in our society. <laughs> I'm like, those things have been banned since before I was born. Like, so far back, I can't even remember it, actually. In 1986, Congress passed the Firearm Owners Protection Act, and it banned the transfer and possession of automatic weapons, which are also known as machine guns. Um, automatic weapons, the basic mechanics of them are you pull the trigger down one time, and until you release it, it will continue spraying bullets, and that's an automatic weapon. It doesn't require multiple trigger pulls. Not allowed. Literally nobody has them except for our government because, of course, they get to keep all the weapons. Um, also, I just want to note, don't you love the name of these bills they pass? Firearm Owners Protection Act. They do this. They pass these terrible bills that have all kinds of crap in them, and then they name them something really sympathetic so that if somebody votes against them, Joe Schmo will be like, can you see? Did you see Rand Paul voted against the, like, Protect Children Act of 2002? He's a monster. no. <laughs> read the bill like jeez i just that drives me nuts i hate that and it works so well the average person falls for it time and time and time again and it's exhausting um in contrast to the automatic weapon you have semi-automatic weapons and these are legal and this term encapsulates weapons where with the mechanism, um, you basically reload the chamber after each shot. So if I'm pulling the trigger, a shot will fire, and then another shot automatically reloads so I can pull the trigger again and it will shoot. That's basically it. Um, so most guns in our country, especially like handguns and, and guns people are actually carrying on their person or using for self-defense, are going to be semi-automatic weapons. Um, those that are not are not really ideal for self-defense. You basically have to fire a shot, stop, reload the chamber, then um, pull the trigger. And so that lay time in between would get you killed. It, it's just not something, it's, that's like what a shotgun is like, maybe something you use for home defense or for hunting. But um, as a whole, semi-automatic guns are, are the most prevalent in our society and they are the smartest choice for people, I think, um, if you're going to be carrying on your person. And I see a lot of misleading headlines given around this topic, around semi-automatic weapons, and they try to make these guns sound more dangerous than they are. Like this headline um, that was on NBC News in 2018, and it says, semi-automatic rifles kill twice as many as other guns. Study finds. Uh, well, yeah, because semi-automatic guns are the most prevalent in our society, so of course they're going to kill more people, Like, right? But if you read that, that makes it sound like semi-automatic guns are somehow more dangerous. If you click the article, what does it say in the subtitle? Researchers who examined FBI data on nearly 250 active shooter assaults also found that the chances of dying, if shot, were the same no matter the weapon. <laughs> These guns are no more deadly or dangerous. This is them intentionally trying to mislead you. And it works because most people don't read the article. They just read the headline. And boy, as a journalist, do I know that. You know what? That should be your all's New Year's Eve resolution. Start reading the freaking articles. Our society would drastically improve just from that very action alone. 
Um, so essentially, when they say they want to just ban assault rifles or they want to just ban semi-automatic weapons, this is a poison pill. They're being disingenuous. Um, they aren't based on any kind of data. And the reality is gun control proponents know this. They're strategic. They intend to move incrementally because otherwise their ideas are dead on arrival. This isn't popular. Um, gun control activists actually began campaigning against assault weapons in the late 1980s after they realized their previous campaign to get handguns banned was going nowhere. Um, in 1988, handgun ban activist John Sugarman made this recommendation to other gun control groups. He said, assault weapons will strengthen the handgun restriction lobby. Handgun restriction consistently remains a non-issue with the vast majority of legislators, the press, and the public. Assault weapons are a new topic. The weapons menacing machine guns versus semi-automatic assault weapons, anything that looks like a machine gun, is assumed to be a machine gun. That can only increase the chance of public support for restrictions on these weapons. Efforts to restrict assault weapons are more likely to succeed than those to restrict handguns. These people aren't stupid. They know what they're doing. They move incrementally, and largely it works, and they, and they use a lot of disinformation. And, and so far, I think they've been moderately successful, although we have seen a really great wave of pushback in the past two decades against that, especially at the state level. So that's, that's, that history and that foundation is important, but I don't think it's the most important in this discussion to truly understand the gun control movement, its goals, and its impacts on society. We have to go back much further than that. Um, so let's go all the way back to before the Civil War. Um, and during that time, black people were prohibited from owning guns under the slave codes. It was generally understood and documented that an armed population would have the ability to rise up and throw off the shackles of slavery. Yeah, that, that's kind of the point of the Second Amendment, you guys. Um, after the war ended, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation um, and the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. That was added to the Constitution. So then states redirected um, and they, they implemented what were known as black codes um, that basically continued to block black people from owning guns. Um, and they did this by arguing that black people were not full citizens and therefore not entitled to full rights, which is an argument that the atrocious Dred Scott Supreme Court case had upheld in 1857. And this was a big issue. In 1865, Frederick Douglass urged federal action to stop state and local infringement on the right to arms. Uh, he said, until this was accomplished, the work of the abolitionist is not finished. So that went on for a period of a couple of years, and then they got some assistance in the mid-1860s to late 1860s. So you had the Freedmen's Bureau Bill of 1865, you had the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1870, um, and then you had the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868. And basically, this series of laws and amendments knocked down these racist laws and made the Second Amendment applicable to all citizens. So after losing that round, the white supremacists decided to try yet another tactic. They're very hard headed. They're going to keep trying. Um, and in the 1870s, states started using facially neutral laws that barred black people from owning guns. And what this means is that the law did not explicitly state this is meant to attack black people, but its intentions were the same and its effects were the same. Um, and, and what this looked like um, was things like police issued licenses and permit laws that allowed states to arbitrarily block certain people from exercising their Second Amendment rights. Um, they had really high business and transaction taxes on guns that was meant to price out uh, black people and poor white people from owning guns. They barred public housing residents from owning guns, which is a proposal we'll continue to see throughout the 1900s, you know, because if you're poor, you lose your rights, as we all know. Uh, they did gun sweeps by police in high crime neighborhoods. That was very popular. All things that we still see the gun control lobby pushing to this day. These aren't new ideas. They've been around for a minute. Um, and arguably during this time, you know, we're moving into the like early 1900s. This was when black people had never needed guns more. Lynchings were increasing drastically. There was so much racist crime and violence going on in our society. And a lot of it was propped up by local governments, by local police departments. Uh, they either were in total support of it and assisted in it, or they turned a blind eye. And, and the black community was really left to fend for itself. Um, Vice president of the National Colored Press Association, John R. Mitchell Jr. encouraged black people to buy Winchesters to protect their families during this time. Ida B. Wells, the leading journalist opposing lynching, agreed in the nationally circulated pamphlet Southern Horrors, um, where Wells documented cases in Kentucky and Florida where the men armed themselves and fended off lynch mobs. 
The lesson this teaches, Wells wrote, is that a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home, and it should be used for that protection, which the law refuses to give. Um, but after that thwarted lynching in Florida, their state legislature passed a licensing bill. Uh, a Florida Supreme Court justice later explained, the act was passed for the purpose of disarming the Negro laborers and was never intended to apply to the white population and in practice has never been so applied. Guys, watch licensing laws. Trace them back. You will find the vast majority came about in this manner with these intentions, and they continue to disadvantage the black population far more so than other people. They have very racist origins, and, and licensing around firearms is no exception. It's really, really gross. I have to say, like, as I was um, researching this next subject, it was, it was emotionally hard. Um, I think most of us know about our history. I think reading about it in detail, about the death, about the violence can be quite disturbing. So I'm, I'm kind of tearing up talking about it now. I just kind of want to get a little bit of a warning that this section can be a little bit hard um, to talk about for me. And I'm a white woman, so I can only imagine um, for people of color, it might be difficult to hear some of this. So I just want to kind of put that out there before I go on. Um, as a result of this violence, black communities began to effectively fight back against white mobs who were attacking and lynching them. Um, there were notable incidents, which include the Atlanta massacre of 1906. Um, and during this event, police stood idly by as 23 black people were murdered over a black man swimming in white water. Um, you had the Tulsa race riots of 1921, which saw white people with government approval burn down a square mile of a prosperous district known as Black Wall Street, where historians estimate the true death total could be as high as 300 people. Um, and there were a series of, of attacks like this, and, and there was a lot of death and, and destruction. Um, but in each of these incidents, there would have been even more life lost um, had the black community not been armed and able to fight back and, and, and take out some of their attackers, essentially, in those incidents. Guys, this is the point of the Second Amendment. You know, I get so infuriated when I hear people say, like, you just need it for hunting, you just need a shotgun. No. That is not the point of the Second Amendment. This is the point of the Second Amendment. This was the government backing up racial violence. Had they not had access to firearms, I don't know where we would be as a country to this day. Um, and I think that that's true for many incidents throughout our history. The government is not your friend. They're not looking out for your liberty. They're not looking out for your well-being. Your Second Amendment is your ability to protect yourself against them and to protect your rights and protect your person and protect your property. It is an essential liberty. Um, it's something I would be willing to die over. I think it's so essential. Like This is one of the fundamental things that our country was established upon. And when you read this powerful and rich history of the black community arming itself and rising up against the suppressors, who again, were within government, um, it's just very powerful. It's, it's, to me, this is like one of the most um, quintessential stories of our history. Um, and basically in this effort, as this continued, it eventually gave way to the civil rights movement and the resulting legislation of the 1960s, which was e extremely hard fought and hard won. Um, and I think, I think we, as like millennials and people younger than me, even we get this sort of like rose colored glasses, you know, there was Martin Luther King Jr. And everybody grabbed hands and they passed the civil rights act and everything was fine. No, there was murder. There were blood in the streets. There were people beaten. There were people put in jail. And a lot of those laws are still in our books and still have racial implications to this day. Um, it, it's really a very, um, it's a hard history to read the details of. And I think that our school should do a better, better job of educating American citizens on what actually went down. Because if you don't know about our past atrocities, you're not going to be able to effectively um, stop them or intervene in the future. Um, so during this time, sorry, a little sidetrack, um, you had the Deacons for Defense, which were formed in 1965, and they fought white supremacy terrorism in Louisiana and Mississippi with .38 special revolvers. And when Dr. King led the Meredith March against fear for voter registration in Mississippi, they provided security for him. So there were a lot of, um, of armed black citizens who were really involved in the Civil Rights um, Act and movement, and they were, they were marching with these crowds, but they were actually providing security oftentimes, um, even against law enforcement and other citizens that sought to harm them. Um, another example, when the Klan targeted North Carolina's Lumbee Indians in 1958 because of their race mixing, the Lumbees drove off the Klan in an armed confrontation, the Battle of Hayes Pond, and the Klan operation ceased in that region. Condoleezza Rice says that she became a self-described Second Amendment absolutist because of her experiences growing up in Birmingham. She recalled the bombings in the summer of 1963 when her father helped guard the streets at night. And she said, had the civil rights workers' guns been registered, they could have been confiscated, rendering the community defenseless. 
Uh, and then you had, in 1966, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense that formed to challenge police brutality that was occurring against the black community, um, especially in the wake of the assassination of Malcolm X. And they organized um, armed citizen patrols in cities and grew up to 2,000 members. But what happened um, as sort of blowback into a lot of this progress and to these movements um, were a lot of, of things that transpired that still, again, came back in and sought to remove the black community's right to their Second Amendment. In 1968, Congress passed the Gun Control Act. Um, Robert Sherrill, who was a supporter, said that legislation was passed not to control guns, but to control black people. Uh, proof that the NRA has always sucked. During that committee hearing, NRA Executive Vice President Franklin Orth supported a ban on mail order sales, stating, We do not think that any sane American who calls himself an American can object to placing into this bill the instrument which killed the President of the United States, referring to JFK. Watch the NRA. I used to fanatically love the NRA. I love the Second Amendment, so why would I not? And if you really start watching them, you'll find out they're not protecting your Second Amendment. They're usually selling you out and things like this, just like they did with the bump stock ban under Trump. Um, they're totally fine. They basically just raise money to enrich their their bureaucracy and their administrators at the top of their organization. They're kind of a Republican shill organization. The Second Amendment group that I worked for initially on this on the ground level in Tennessee had formed because the NRA kept screwing them at the state legislature and coming in and advocating for bad bills or killing good bills around guns. You'll never see the NRA get involved when a black person is killed exercising their Second Amendment right. And this is my hard line in the sand. Um, I saw what happened when Philando Castile was murdered a number of years ago, murdered by a police officer in cold blood. He did everything they tell you to do. As a Second Amendment um, user, I carry all the time. When, when you're pulled over, you're supposed to stop your car, turn it off, put your hands on the wheels, let them know immediately, hi, I have a permit, I'm carrying, this is where it is. He did all of those things. Um, when I do that, officers are like, that's great, sweetie. What kind of gun do you have? Oh, it's in your Louis Vuitton? Go ahead, reach in, get your license, no problem. We're just gonna give you a warning today. I've gotten out of every single ticket I've ever been pulled over for when I've been carrying my gun. In contrast, Philando Castile, who was never in the wrong whatsoever. I think he got pulled over for like a broken tail light. He did the exact same procedure I just described. And the idiot cop got so nervous and was, I don't know what was wrong with him. He pulled out his gun and fired like this into the car with his daughter, his little girl in the back seat of that car and murdered him. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen uh, transpire in this country. And the NRA did not say a freaking word about it. They haven't said a freaking word about Breonna Taylor, whose boyfriend was trying to defend her and himself from the police SWAT team that wrongfully broke into her apartment and killed her. They always stay on the sidelines. I'm done with them. Don't give them any money. They're awful. There are really good gun groups out there. There are state-based gun groups. There's things like the National Gun Association. There's a really cool um, Second Amendment group called Black Guns Matter that is all about arming the black community. I love that organization. If you're somebody giving to the NRA and you support the Second Amendment, take your money away and go give it to a group actually defending our rights and actually defending the rights of all people. I'm sick of this. <sighs> Sorry. That just really boils my blood, though. Um, following that, you then had the Gun Control Act of, sorry, after the Gun Control Act of 1968, you then had, in 1993, the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, and this introduced a background check requirement of prospective gun purchasers by licensed sellers, and it created the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS, to prevent firearm sales to prohibited people. So, uh, guys, we've already got these background checks. Like, whenever I hear people say they want universal background checks, I'm like, we have... <laughs> background checks we it's actually pretty difficult to buy a gun it's really difficult to buy a gun across state lo, um, lines there's like this one tiny loophole that i'll get to in a little bit where you can buy um without a background check at like gun shows but that's yeah it's minuscule so anyways we've had background checks for a long long time and they haven't really proven to do anything uh, as far as actually lowering the crime rate um, also, the 1993 bill, and this is important, created a list of categories of individuals to whom the sale of firearms is prohibited, among them those individuals who have been convicted of a felony crime. To date, no state restores these rights. Guys, no, uh, no other right do we say you just lose indefinitely if you do something wrong. One, it is so easy to get a felony in this country. There are so many stupid laws. There are so many laws that should not be criminal laws. As a whole, I just cannot fathom that we would ever permanently take away somebody's right, especially one as essential as self-defense. Um, after they serve their time, they pay their dues, they should have the rights restored. That is 
wildly crazy. And also, wouldn't you just happen to know that African American adults are 5.9 times likely, more likely, to be incarcerated than white people. So it just so happens that black people lose their rights to the Second Amendment and this method far more than other populations. I'm just shocked. Shocked, I tell you. I can't believe it. So weird how that works out. Uh, today, black people continue to be the most targeted by our gun control laws. Um, to date, about 36% of white people own a gun, compared to only 24% of black people. In 2018, 56% of federal firearm offenders were black. And that doesn't mean that they were, like, committing more crimes. That means they were being policed and arrested more and targeted. Um, you have Stop and Frisk, which is infamous for its role in the police harassment of black Americans, and that was largely initiated to enforce gun control measures. Um, you see that black Americans are more likely than any other group to be convicted of and subject to a firearms offense carrying a mandatory minimum sentence. And people have got to learn this basic, basic principle, which is that for every new law is a new opportunity for governmental abuse that is often carried out at the hands of police. That's inescapable. So every time you argue for a new gun control law, you're probably more likely to end up hurting the black community and putting more people in jail for arbitrary offenses than anything else. It's not helpful. Um, every law we put into place is, is going to actually come down to the community's most police, which black people are already three times more likely to be killed by police. So you can't really be serious about reforming our justice system, reforming policing, and then simultaneously want to give them more opportunities to abuse people. Come on, y'all. Keep up. This isn't hard. This is common sense. Um, and then lastly, there's another important point here that, that people need to like wrap their minds around, which is that bans on products do not work. They never work, period, ever, 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 ever. If you know it about drugs, you should know it about guns and vice versa. All you do is create a black market, create inequality, and put more people in jail for nonviolent offenses stop. And some, some left-wing groups are actually waking up to this. I'll talk about this a little bit more towards the end, but I have noticed, and I'm excited about this, that I am seeing a movement, especially among left-wing groups that are working in the justice um, space, where they're recognizing that, like, targeting guns is the wrong, wrong direction. So that's the history, and it's horrible. Um, but not only is gun control systemically racist, it also doesn't work. So we're, we've done all of this um, for policies that don't make us safer. And in fact, the data shows the exact opposite. Um, first and foremost, mass shootings account for only 2% of annual gun deaths. They're very, very rare. And so basing um, gun policy around these attacks is, is not really the place we should start operating from, but that has been the push by the media and those on the left, I think because they're the most shocking deaths and they feel like that's how they can probably best push uh, gun control. But as a whole, it's a, it's a very small population of gun deaths. Um, it's also a pretty arbitrary bar to be included in this stat too. The only real um, level or limit is that the shooting must only involve four or more people with a motivation to kill. According to the Crime Prevention Research Center, the U.S. makes up 1.49% of the murders worldwide, only 2.2% of the attacks with guns, and less than 1.15% of the mass public shooters. All these numbers are much less than America's 4.6% share of the world's population. So while there's this huge push to make it look like we're so much more violent than the rest of the world, like, not even, not even a little bit, like, not even remotely true. Um, of the 97 countries where they identified mass public shootings, the U.S. actually ranked 64th per capita in its rate of attacks and 65th in fatalities. Uh, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, the frequency of foreign mass public shootings since 1998 has actually grown 291% faster than those in the U.S., um, another stereotype that's out there, and this is actually another issue I'm passionate about because I'm very passionate about mental health issues. Um, there's a stigma that, like, mass shooters are all mentally ill. It's not the case. In fact, only 4 to 5 percent of those involve people with severe mental illnesses. Um, and actually, far from being the most likely to commit violence, people with mental illness are far more likely to be a victim of violence than they are to be a perpetrator. Uh, on top of that, we see that more than 60 percent of the gun deaths in America every year are due to suicide. If we want to talk about improving public health and safety and lowering the gun death rate, all of our attention needs to be on suicides. Like that is the vast majority of gun deaths. And, um, and 
you know, there's some people who try to say, well, it's the gun's fault. If we remove the gun, you won't have as many suicides. Doesn't check out either. Notably, Japan has the second highest suicide rate among industrialized nations while simultaneously maintaining very strict gun controls. They actually ban handguns entirely and only um, shotguns and air rifles are allowed. So that's a good comparison case to look at and it doesn't wash. I don't think that uh, the method by which someone uses to commit suicide should be the focus. We need to commit on the root cause of the problem, which is that they have suicidal ideations and prevent that, right? We need to get them treatment. Uh, banning the gun doesn't help. They're just going to find another method as we see in Japan. And it's for this reason that I think the suggestion of red flag laws go in the wrong direction. They were something I was sort of open to when I first heard about them because as um, somebody who has mental health issues in my family, I do know what it's like to have a relative that is having a psychotic episode who we're worried about um, being a danger to themselves or others. And once they're 18, the family has no control. There is so little you can do as a family. And if you call the police, they're like, well, they haven't done anything yet. So we can't do anything until they do something. Right. And it's this terrible catch 22, like gray area that we have in society. And there's no easy answers for it. Um, so when I first heard about red flag laws, I was like, hmm, maybe. And basically under red flag laws, um, the way most states have proposed them or, or implemented them is that your family can come forward and say, this person needs to be under a hold where they can't access guns, can't buy guns because they're having a psychotic episode. And like, supposed to be temporary. You're supposed to be able to go back in and argue for your rights back. Um, as I thought about it more, I never, one, the government never gives you your rights back. So you just kind of have to accept that there. Two, I think, you know, when I think about my family's ability to intervene and act ethically in those situations, I would trust them. But not everybody has a great family. I think it could easily lead to abuse. Um, but almost more important than those issues with the policy when I really think about their impact on the mental health community, I think it would be pretty dire. I think that those laws would make people less likely to seek treatment. I think that it would further stigmatize mental illness. Um, I think it would continue to focus on the cause and or of the you know symptom versus the cause of the problem, which I think again should be on mental health treatment and intervention. And so as a whole, I've really turned against red flag laws. I just don't think they're a good idea. They're not as bad as other gun control laws I've heard proposed. Um, but at the end of the day, we need people to get treatment. And if this law prevents that, I think that's something that would actually probably contribute contribute to more deaths. So I've turned against those. Um, anyways, there are some disputes about the percentage of mass shootings that occur in gun-free zones, but I'm going to advocate that gun-free zones should be done away with, and I want to dig into kind of that argument um, to get into this, this part of the discussion. So economist John Lott found that 8% of mass public shootings since 1950s have taken place in gun-free zones. I'm sorry, 80%. <laughs> 80% of mass public shootings since 1950 have taken place in gun-free zones. The anti-gun group Everytown found that 10% of mass shootings between 2009 and 2016 took place in gun-free zones. So there was this big dispute, um, and basically the Washington Post decided to call referee and come in and, and look at both sides' data. And they examined the stats, and they found that under Lott's methodology, about 86% of mass public shootings did take place in gun-free zones between 2009 and 16. So they were looking at the shorter window. Um, and the gap could basically be explained by this. Lot excluded gang-related shootings. Remember, you only have to have four people involved in the shooting um, for it to be considered a, um, a mass attack or a mass shooting. Um, he excluded residential shootings in his data, which are typically not um, random attacks that are usually carried out by family members. Um, so basically, Lot was examining the shootings that most of us would, con would actually consider a mass shooting, which would be a random act of shooter um, trying to kill a large group of people that are unknown to them. Um, every town also excluded gun-free zones where a police officer might or could be present in their data. And I, that makes me so angry. I think that is an obvious attempt to skew the data. Be serious. Um, in Parkland, we found out that cops don't even have an obligation to provide you with security under a mass attack. So if it's a gun-free zone and I can't carry my gun and I'm then dependent on some lawmaker who has no obligation, um, to actually jump in and defend me, that is a gun-free zone. It is so intellectually dishonest for them to try to exclude that. And I find that group to be highly intellectually dishonest across the board. Um, but that just really irks me. So I think we should go with the higher, the obvious, um, look at actual mass attacks. Look at how many of them occur in gun-free zones. And based on those statistics, over 80% occur in gun-free zones. There is an obvious solution here. 
in gun-free zones. A person who is committed to carrying out violence is going to go for the easiest targets. And I think they're going to choose to do that whether they have access to a gun or not. A person committed to carrying out violence is going to attempt to go through with it in some capacity or not. To date, the largest school killing in history actually took place in Bath, Michigan in the 1920s. And it was some guy who like rigged his um, pickup truck with explosives and pulled it up next to the, to the school and it exploded and it killed something like 30 children. The guns are not the problem. That is the symptom. We need to get to the root cause of problems. Um, and obviously, with a gun-free zone, you're, made, you're making people sitting ducks. So the less of those um, places that you have in a society, the less opportunities these people will have to come in and have sitting targets that can't shoot back. Um, and I think that we do see, by the lack of these kinds of attacks in places that are not gun-free zones, that these people are looking for easy targets. So that should be an obvious, obvious solution right there. Get rid of gun-free zones. Um, there's other stubborn statistics that show that a gun ownership, as the gun ownership rate in this country has increased, gun violence has actually decreased. Um, studies by both the Department of Justice and the Pew Research Center back this up. Not only do they show homicides have decreased as gun ownership increased, but suicides have as well. Uh, these studies also found that of those who committed crimes with guns, only 2% obtained the firearm through a gun show or flea market, whereas 40% already obtained it from an illegal source. Um, and they found that 56% of people believe gun crime has been increasing thanks to media coverage, when in reality, we've seen a 49% decrease in gun homicides over the past three decades. It is startling the drop off we have seen in gun homicide rates. And again, that has been while we've seen massive explosion in the number of people buying guns, and the number of guns in circulation. So all signs point to this, more guns actually equal less crime. Estimates also show that 162,000 cases per year exist where someone almost certainly would have been killed if they had not used a gun for protection. Other estimates show that Americans use guns in self-defense somewhere between 500,000 to 3 million times a year. Um, it's relatively e easy to measure the number of lives that are lost due to criminal gun violence. It's harder to measure the number of lives that are saved due to legal defensive gun use. Um, murders that didn't happen, they don't show up in crime statistics, so it's a bit harder to track. Um, and it, it lends itself to this idea of the seen and the unseen, which is a principle by Frederick Bastiat that he talks about in his book, The Law, which everybody should read. It's one of the most essential books um, that we have. But he talks about how, like, when we're trying to decide public policy, this is part of the problem is people only see these effects. They don't see all the undercurrents and things that would be happening were certain things not in place. So um, how many guns save lives every year? We can't truly say, but certainly somewhere at least equal to the number of lives that are lost. And I would say probably far higher. Um, continually, we see that cities and states with the strictest gun laws also see the highest rates of gun violence, which goes back to my point that gun bans do not work. None of this is grounded in data. Um, California and Illinois lead the country in mass shootings. These states have the strictest gun laws on the books. New York, which makes it practically impossible for anyone but the rich or those in power to own a gun. Trust me, I know I was there until May of this year. Uh, they've seen 166% gun violence increase during COVID. Chicago has seen 700 homicides and 3,000 shootings thus far in 2020. Um, its leaders claim this actually coincided with a decrease in crime. Dallas, which is a comparable city um, for size, but a much redder city has much looser gun control laws. For comparison, they are having one of their most violent years and have 227 homicides thus far, compared to 700 homicides, which Chicago says is down. So as a whole, these gun control solutions just simply do not work. And there's far better things we could be doing that would actually save lives like ending gun-free school zones. I think arming teachers, allowing them to conceal carry is a very smart idea. It's common sense, especially since the law enforcement officers at schools have no obligation to protect them. Um, I know my mother was a teacher and if she had had the opportunity to carry, she would have done it. And she's an excellent shot. We've actually done the cop training in our family where you're like in an interaction and you're having to try to deescalate and decide when to shoot and how to shoot and like watch out for hostages. And she nailed it. Like she was incredible. Um, I also think we should bring back basic gun safety instructions in schools. You know, back in the day, we had marksmanship classes in schools. Kids were taught about guns. They were taught to respect them. They were taught how to use them. And as a whole, we had a better society that respected these firearms, and we didn't see as many violence issues um, at that time in schools. We do need better mental health care and responses. Like, I'm with you on the left. Like, this is something we need it is something that, like, I'll work with you 100%. I want to find these solutions. We need to address the root causes. Those include things like early intervention, 
access to care. We need to be expanding telehealth, removing regulations that make it harder for people to get health care. Um, I'm very excited about the new emergency number that Ajit Pai just issued nationally um, in his role with the FTC. We need educational initiatives to teach people about their mental health and to teach them how to cure or treat themselves when they are having issues. Um, and these are, you know, some of this is cultural responses. We need um, families. We need community leaders. We need churches to step up and really um, take ownership in the mental health problem in our society because it's big and it's only growing with these lockdowns. It's a huge issue. We need to arm more people. Like I said, there's some progressive groups that are finally like getting this and I'm really stoked about them. Um, there's one called the Trigger Warning Queer and Trans Gun Club. And there's one called the Socialist Rifle Association, and they're working on arming and training vulnerable populations to use the Second Amendment to protect themselves. I'm like ecstatic about that. Like, where do I donate? I just think that's so cool. Um, and then we need to focus our resources on violence intervention. There are so many cool things happening in communities around violence intervention, and they're happening oftentimes outside of the government apparatus, sometimes in private public partnerships within the government apparatus. But there's really cool stuff like there's this operation called ceasefire that started in baltimore to address really high crime rates specifically around um younger populations those more likely to be in in gangs and those most likely to um, lose their lives to gun violence because they were involved in this gang activity and they do these things where they have call-ins that bring like gang members people um with firearm priors you know the most at-risk populations together and they involve all levels of government and community support faith leaders um community leaders people looking for jobs training and they basically um, extend to each participant an opportunity for education, for training, for counseling, for treatment, the necessary tools for change. And they're seeing incredible results at de-escalating actual gun violence in those communities. So um, that's another place I think you could give your money that would be well worth the time. So that is my conclusion for today. Um, again, if you can share the show, post it, help me get the word out, I would appreciate it. Episode two did really well. We were, I think, over 6,000 views the last time I looked, so we're still tracking in the top 10%. I'm so excited. I hope you're enjoying the show. Some of you gave me some really cool feedback on Facebook and Twitter recently for uh, future subjects that I can't wait to dig into. Um, so I'll be back the last Monday of every month. And until then, Happy New Year. Guys, we've made it through 2020. I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>